Hello from ABA Annual 2016 in San Francisco, California. I'm Kareem Arif. I'm Karen Korematsu. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for coming on the show with us. We're on the road today, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Today, we wanted to talk a little bit about your story and kind of get into uh, some of your thoughts on what's going on in today's world. Are we better off? So I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your story. Well, thank you uh, to the ABA and inviting me to speak to your audience. Uh, This is an exciting uh, opportunity. Even though I am not an attorney, uh, I promote attorneys and is, and also encourage young people to go to law school. I'm Karen Korematsu, and I'm Fred Korematsu's daughter. My father had the landmark Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus the United States, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, challenged the uh, military orders and the constitutionality of the Japanese-American incarceration during World War II. Absolutely. And in 1983, through evidence that was found in Washington, D.C. by Professor Peter Irons and um, Aiko Hershik Yotsunaga, who was doing research, they found the evidence that proved that there was no military necessity. At the time of my father's Supreme Court hearing in 1944, the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, had altered evidence, and destroyed evidence. So tell us a little bit about how that affected you. I mean, growing up in this kind of situation, what did that mean? What what was it like growing up in this? Well, my father was born in Oakland, California, so he was an American citizen, and my brother and I were both born in Oakland, California. However, uh, you know, this is soon after Pearl Harbor, so we just, you were just like any other kids. We grew up in, a, in, in the East Bay, in, a, in the southern part. Um, most of the families were Caucasian. And we did get bullied in, in, um, in school. So I always hated the, the photo of uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th because the teacher would throw it up and you know, talk about how awful that Japan, uh, Imperial Japan, had bombed Pearl Harbor and how many lives were lost. And um, I mean, certainly that was, you know, that's a tragic, you know, story. But the kids would blame us for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. They would call us racist names. They would say, mm-hmm. go back to Japan. You don't belong here. And and so that was the environment that my brother and I grew up in. And However, we never said anything to our parents. We, we didn't even say anything to our teachers. Uh, you know, to this day, we call that bullying, right? And at that time, that's not what was, you know, ever discussed. It was like the, the kid in the schoolyard that wanted your lunch money. You know, that was being bullied, so to speak. So... It was not until I was a junior in high school uh, studying U.S. history that our teacher had assigned a little paperback book for each of uh, the students to read in the class, and the assignment was to get up in front of the, uh, the class and give an oral book report. My friend's book, Maya, was called Concentration Camps USA. Mm-hmm. And she gets up in front of the class and then starts up talking about the Japanese-American internment. And I thought, Wow. That's interesting. What's that about? And then she was went on to say there was this one man who avoided the military orders, and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. Oh, that's my name. I'm right. saying to myself, yeah, absolutely. And I have 35 pairs of eyes turning around and looking at me, and I'm shrugging my shoulders, thinking, "Well, that's some black sheep of the family," because she, Maya didn't say Fred Kormatsu; she just said Kormatsu versus the United States. Right. And so after class, I asked her. I said, "Maya, what's this about?" She says, "Well, this is about your father." And I said, no way. Somebody would have told me. You so weren't aware? I wasn't aware. So I go home and I confront my mother. And yes, that's about your, your dad. And then I get the standard answer, you know, wait till he gets home, mm-hmm. you know, and ask him. Not only did my father uh, have um, housing discrimination, he also had employment discrimination and sometimes worked two jobs and then get home until eight o'clock at night. So Absolutely. obviously, you know, that's a long time after three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And when I asked him about it and told him what Maya had reported that day, he just said to me, it happened a long time ago and what he did he thought was right and the government was wrong. 
Wow. It was that clear and simple. It wasn't complicated. And I could just see this hurt go over his face. And I, I was so close to my daddy, I couldn't ask him any more questions, except to the point today, I did ask him, can you vote? Yeah. Because I knew voting was very important to my parents. They would study the ballot. They would discuss it. And so I, I just want to take this opportunity to remind everybody to vote. But the irony, too, also to the story is my younger brother, Ken, who is four years younger than I am, right. found out about my father's Supreme Court case the same way in high school. Really? Yeah, we didn't have dinner talk, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right. They just didn't want to bring it up, I guess. Well, they were waiting until we got older. Right. That was the that was the answer when I asked. And it is a, a complicated uh, story. And I don't think my father, he just didn't know how we would react, right? You have a federal, you found out your dad has a federal prison record. What does that mean? And I, I didn't know what that meant. Right. Uh, and the only thing I, I did realize was several years later, he, my father wanted to uh, obtain his real estate license for the state of California. And he had gone to the community college and studied and then took the test and, uh, and passed it with flying colors. And okay. then you have this form that you have to fill out. And it says, you know, do you have a prison record or any type of felony record? And uh, even misdemeanor. And, and, and they, you, you know, he said yes, and checked it yes. And so therefore he could never uh, receive his uh, real estate license, which he was really disappointed because he wanted to help those people that also had problems with trying to, to buy a house. Right, my father always had to buy a house through a third party. He never could buy a house on his own because right. no one would sell anybody who was Asian American. Wow. Now you hit on a lot of really interesting points, and specifically reminding folks to vote in this election. I think that really brings us into the present right now, where we're seeing, at least from what I can see, a lot of similar type of rhetoric of blaming Americans who look like these foreigners who have done. I mean, tragic things to U.S. citizens and really blaming the American citizens for that. Do you think we're ending up in a similar situation today as we were back then? Yes, and I think even worse, uh, if, mm. if that's even, you know, possible. It, uh, the parallels between the Japanese-American uh, World War II incarceration and what's happening now to, you know, the Muslim, Arab, and Amimsa community in general is appalling. It, this is the 21st century, and we... We have been, you know, coming to this point of fear mongering, of of bigotry, of you know, just racial prejudice, to the point that even children are afraid to go to school. You know, I've been told stories of of Muslim children who who don't want to go to school because they've been told that ISIS is going to come and get them. Yeah. Or they've been bullied and being blamed also. Uh, even this happened after 9-11 in 2001, when children were being blamed for the bombing of, of, uh, of the Twin Towers in, in New York and the, and the Pentagon. Yeah. You know, it, it's what type of lessons, what are we teaching children if we have that type of rhetoric? And mm -hmm. no one seems to be accountable for it. That's mm -hmm. the shocking part. So that's why through the Fred T. Korematsu Institute that I founded in 2009, we focus on education. Right. On, on K through 12 education so that uh, you know, teachers can go to our website, KorematsuInstitute.org, which I'll give a plug now, Fantastic. and sign up for teaching kits for free. Because not only do we teach about Fred Korematsu's fight for justice and the Japanese-American incarceration of World War II, but how it relates to our issues today of national security, of racial profiling, of immigration. Mm. And you know, it's important, we've seen by the discussions that I've been having lately, that we need to start educating children when they're in elementary school age. And that's why we have lesson plans for elementary, middle school, and high school. And then I also work with higher education and speak to uh, universities and law schools. Because obviously, we have not learned the lessons of history. We continually make the same mistakes. Even after 9-11, my father's Supreme Court case, 
was cited, core matzo versus the United States, as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. Yeah. Last year, in November, the Roanoke mayor of Virginia cited Executive Order 9066, which is what President Roosevelt issued to incarcerate 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry. Two-thirds were American citizens Absolutely. and put them in American concentration camps. That was 2015, and he's citing the executive order as a good document. It is not a good document. And next year is the 75th, quote, you know, anniversary of Executive Order 9066. And we, we need to, to recognize that, that document for, for what it was. Um, in fact, the Smithsonian were having a special event at the American History Museum in February, around uh, February 19th, which is Day of Remembrance. And, w and I would encourage everyone to go and see that exhibit. They're going to bring out this executive order and also the other artifacts of some of the items from the incarceration camps. It's actually eerie the way, the way you talk about these documents and your own experiences. Uh, being a Muslim American myself who grew up born and raised in California, grew up, I completely understood everything you were saying immediately, having lived through the tragedy that was 9-11, being blamed, receiving racial profiling, and having people talk to me a certain way, bully me, deal with these things, and just kind of growing up in that environment. So it's eerie that you say it's, it's similar to what it was. It may even be worse. And I guess I wonder, what are we supposed to do? What, what can we do at this point to try to avoid the mistakes of the past. We need to make people accountable for what they say. Okay. And also we need to challenge people when they make these negative statements. All right. To speak up. My father said to stand up for what is right and don't be afraid to speak up. Mm -hmm. So when someone is saying something against you or other uh, Muslim and Arab Americans or the MEMSA community or even African Americans or Latinos because we have we have all kinds of issues in this this country where we have not addressed racial healing and if we don't yes. if we don't address racial healing in this country then we're never going to to get to racial equity Absolutely. and so you know sometimes it's one to one and we well, one of my favorite stories is is speaking to a kindergarten class of five year olds All right. and a first grade class of six year olds. And I had to learn how to speak to these young people in terms that they would understand. And I learned to, to use the words, you know, fair and unfair. But I explained to them, you know, what had happened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, how this whole group of Japanese Americans, including children and anyone who was ill, was removed from the West Coast, removed from their homes. They lost everything. They could only take with them what they could carry in two hands, about 50 pounds each, and ended up in these desolate, well, first in horse stalls, because mostly that's where they were put up and down the, the West Coast. And, you know, my father said, you know, horse stalls are for horses, not for people, because they smelled like manure, they were whitewashed, right. they, you know, there was dysentery, the, the food was bad, there was no privacy, they lost their dignity. Now, that's not, that's not right. And, right. and so when I was talking to these children and, and explaining to them you know, what had happened during that time, I had this five-year-old say to me, so what you're saying is that we have done nothing wrong, we have to go to prison camp, we don't know how long we're going to be away, and we can't take with us what we want. Is that right? And I said, yes. Wow. And I had a hundred five-year-olds and six-year-olds go, oh. Wow. To the point where even children can get that so easily. It seems, it seems counterintuitive that we're in a situation where it's not being addressed. Exactly. And that's what's so outrageous. Absolutely. If five-year-olds and six-year-olds understand what, you know, the impact of these types of, you know, bullying and discrimination and prejudice and, and, and all that that goes with it, then why can't adults? Right. And, you know, we all need to work together. And what I try to promote to students especially is this, we're diversified, right? We keep telling everyone we're a melting pot. We come from all different walks of life and, and different countries. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, though, we are Americans. 
Yes. What does it mean to be an American in this country? What does our citizenship mean? And even if you're an immigrant, as citizens, we should be helping those people that are immigrants and those people that are also facing these types of abuse. Wow. So in discussing, you discussed racial healing so we can reach equity. If we're in a situation that we don't begin racial healing soon, do you think we're on the brink of another internment incident? I go back to a quote that U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia said to, a, to the law school in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. And the, one of the students asked him about, you know, Korematsu versus the United States, because it's, it, I should point out, it is still on the Supreme Court record. Even though my father's conviction was overturned in 1983, of course, for attorneys, they know there's no basis for appeal, right? And the Supreme Court can only reverse itself. Mm -hmm. So unless you have this type of precedent where you can cite it and address it, it's still there. It's still considered, quote, good law, even though it's been discredited. But any president can use it in times of executive order and cite it as a reason to round up any group of people that they wish and put them in American concentration camps. So how close are we? He said, you are kidding if you don't think something like the Japanese American internment could happen again. And then he quoted a Latin term that basically says, in times of war, the law falls silent. Now, this is a U.S. Supreme Court justice. And whether you are in favor of his decisions or not, that said a lot. And that's what we need to be reminded of, that we can't assume that it will never happen again, that we need to make sure that we have those safeguards to make people accountable. At least now, the difference is we do have other organizations that can speak up if something like this does happen, because that's what happened after 9-11. Whereas in the time of 1942, there really weren't those kinds of organizations. But we all, you know, my father loved to speak to attorneys because he knew that, or he had hoped, that at least all of you had learned about your civil rights, that you studied constitutional law, and that you would be bound by your oath to protect our civil liberties and the Constitution. This cannot be taken lightly. And, you know, even if you side with one political party or another, at the end of the day, that the law is, is we need to uphold. And we need to be sure that we educate our attorneys to have that, you know, critical thinking, to have that sense of right and wrong, and to, to know that at the end of the day, justice is important for all. Absolutely. I've heard that quote about the law falling silent, and the one I read specifically added, it shouldn't at the end. That's right. Thank you so much for being on the show. Just before we wrap up, if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Uh, they can uh, send an email to info at korematsuinstitute.org uh, or go to the website uh, www.koromatsuinstitute.org and like I said they can encourage you know, people have children out there encourage their teachers to sign up for these teaching kits and, uh, and they can uh, get a hold of us uh, that way we're in San Francisco at the uh, Presidio Army Base which is very ironic because that's where General John DeWitt helped to issue the exclusion orders for Japanese Americans to be incarcerated so it's come full circle but I I want to, to show that education really is, is important and to remind everyone, as my father said, don't be afraid to speak up. Wow, thank you. Well, we've reached the end of the road for today's On the Road Legal Talk Network episode. I want to thank our guest, Karen Korematsu, for joining us today. And we want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard today, please rate us on iTunes. We'll see you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. Thank you so much. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. 
The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.